Hello, welcome to the All or Not podcast. Our official sponsors are KR Couriers and Transport Limited. This is a North West based courier company delivering all across the UK. They can assist in home moves and removals to large, heavy and bulky items, collections and drop-offs. Fast, safe and reliable deliveries. Please get in touch for a free quote. You'll find all the information within the description. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and welcome to Paul Stansby from yes, Paul Stansby podcast. Uh, yeah, oh, <laughs> bit, I, of mouthful, bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Bit of a mouthful, I know, that was like Peter Piper picked a strum. But anyway, so you've had a little bit of a journey on your way down. Yeah, yeah, we did, mate. Got about half hour away and had a blowout. Yeah, but you're here. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself so the audience gets to know who you are. Um... I uh, I come from very humble beginnings, you know, like uh, you know, council estate, uh, mum, mother of four. So it was me, my older brother, my older sister, and my younger sister. Uh, very tight family, uh, very close. Um, it was more for us that stayed connected rather than um, us all going off at friends. If one of us went out to play, we all had to go out to play together, you know. So very very tight family. Mm. Um, poor. And me, me dad, he was, uh, he was a bit hands on with me mum, you know, so, um, you know, I witnessed a lot of, a lot of domestic violence, um, throughout, throughout my childhood, uh, to the point where my mum, um, ended up getting moved into a secure unit. So we, we grew up in women's refuges and stuff. So I spent most of my life in, uh, women's refuges, uh, surrounded by women, um, didn't really have much of a, a male a male um role model yeah really yeah. so uh 387 women in one house i say it was a house it was like a massive unit you know shared front room shared kitchen you know it was really nice it was it was nice you know you have you know i was pretty much the only the only young boy in there i had uh, white curly hair and and blue eyes and all the mums they all had daughters so they really really loved me you know but um yeah, I spent most of that. I've been in and out of schools right away throughout. Um, I said before in other podcasts, I've been to over 100 schools and some people don't tend to believe that, but it's absolutely true, you know. Um, sometimes I was at school for one day. Have you had people disbelieving you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Commenting and saying, I can't be true. Yeah, so you, I had one comment once where I turned around and said, over 100 schools, yeah, all right, you know, just like, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, it's it, it's thing because I lived it. You know, not being able to connect with anyone throughout my childhood. It's really different. I was quite a recluse when I was younger. Now I'm I'm really out there, you know, like a... Bit of a social yeah, butterfly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not like out clubbing and stuff like that, but I, I can connect in rooms, you know, like I, I connect with people straight away, um, you know, open conversations, all of the above. When I was a kid, I always stayed quite off, quiet. Yeah. yeah, really closed off because I didn't feel like there was any point making any friends. There weren't no point because I knew that once my dad found my mum again, we was off. And it was literally like that. If my dad was having a bit of a lazy one and uh, it took him a, a month or so to find us, I'd be at that school for a month or so. And I think to myself, this is it. I'm, I can start, you know, I can start being Paul, you know, I can start, you know, having friends and stuff. And then as soon as you let yourself go like that, he finds us, we moved emergency housing straight away, you know? So it got to the point where I just give up with it all. Is this like, is this the norm? Like your dad's like very violent and a lot of domestic violence going on. Yeah, and he's, well, he's chasing your mum around the country. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the violent side of it was, you know, I never ever saw him be violent to anyone else other than my mum, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, towards me, when I was a kid, my my dad loved me. Do you know what I mean? Like I could tell he loved me. Yeah. You know I can tell that. You know I was his son. You know, um, but he can't lay hands on a woman. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Whether I'm his son or not. But so I, I, you know, I was taken out of that situation. I weren't allowed to, you know, be around me old man. I weren't allowed time with him. And you know, for the security of my mum, we got moved on. Um, so every time he did find her, obviously he didn't turn up very nice. 
you know so as he turn up was he drinking nah no nah. the influence of any drugs or anything no nah. nah so he was just fucking nuts with it yeah he was just uh you know to he he's quite a um you know quite a possessive guy so it's got to be done like he's kind of way, control. you know, yeah, the controlling side of things, mind games and stuff, you know. And if you fall out, I guess you get a whack, you know. Well, that's what happened to my mum anyway. Yeah, fucking hell. So, of course, you know, like from doing podcasts, and you've probably found this yourself, a, a lot of trauma from you causing problems as an adult or as a young adult coming in comes from trauma that you've had as a child. Yeah, um, a lo- yeah, yeah. yeah and a lot of people, they they think like, if they don't pay attention or, you know, they have an argument in a separate room and you hear the ambience of, of the noise, you know, that it isn't going to affect you or you're too young, you'll forget it by the time you get older. You really don't, you know, and it does have it does have a negative effect on you. Well, that's you why they've older. got something called Ace, which is adverse child, childhood experiences. Yeah. You know, obviously the trauma is contributed from an early age by what's impacting you around you know, either the household, school, or the surroundings you're in. You know, I've experienced that. And like you said, yeah, you know, when you're sharing stuff with people on a podcast, you can identify and it brings up that trauma. But it not only brings up theirs, it brings up your own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and with yourself as well, I don't know whether this happens to you, but every time you do a podcast, you are stronger. But it does affect you because it takes you back. You know, it takes you back to that feeling to because you can connect with the person that you're talking to because you've experienced it. It's not like when you, they say, you should go and speak to a psychiatrist or something, and you end up speaking to someone that's been in school their whole life, come from a really good family, you know, and they're, they're trying to understand you by, by the book. Mm. But unless you felt that, you can't connect with it. So every time that you're that little bit stronger, so you, I help you, you help me, just from, just from talking, because yeah. it's very important to talk, right? Especially for men, because yeah. men don't talk. So it's very important to talk. And when you start talking or you're listening, being a male listening to me, I know we're doing it for the podcast and for the viewers and stuff, but me just talking about it to you and you looking at me with that understanding, it helps me, of course, Mm. you know, and that we're two strong men mentally now talking about it on camera for other people to see that it's okay to talk. It's important to talk. You have to talk. Mm. Because that can lead to so many, so many negatives, you know, and and even worse for a lot of people, they don't have an out game. So the only way they look at it is suicide, and that's just because they didn't speak or because yeah. somebody didn't listen, you know. The solution for them is to escape, either through drugs, or fucking like you said, suicide. You know, I've seen it so many times. Yeah. You know, friends that won't pick up the phone, won't reach out. Got that suit, that pride where they, they feel as if like they know enough not to like share what's going on and they can deal with it on their own. I mean dad was a big one for that to be fair. Yeah. You know, he kinda isolated. But we'll get back to that on mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it it's it, it's true. Like you are a product of what you accept, you know, and what you put out there. Yeah. If you choose to be closed, people will be closed with you. If you choose to be open, people will see that energy and they'll be open too. And with that, you're helping each other without even telling each other you're helping each other. And that's the important thing, is knowing that it's okay. It is okay for a man to be able to break down some barriers yeah. of um, male pride, male strength. Masculinity. Masculinity. Male masculinity. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So from that, I was kind of the opposite. I didn't break from all of this. I I built myself, slowly I built myself up, you know, to a point where um, I'd learned to be on my own. So, like, being on your own, when you accept it, it's not as lonely as what you think it is until you end up letting go and surrounding yourself with people. You realise, like, wow, did I really put myself on hold for this man that hasn't got anything to do with my life? So the control and the power that my dad had, still, without even being anywhere near me, he still owned that. He yeah. owned my he, he owned my silence. He owned he had the power to be able to make me be alone without even being there. 
sad, isn't it? Unreal, mate. Unreal, because what we don't understand when we're bringing our children up or when we other people are bringing children up is the long-term damage, you know? The trauma of something so simple, like my mum and dad breaking up. That affects so many people in, in, in ways that you don't even realise it until you find family, until you find a life, until you start living. You don't realise how much it actually affects you and how much control that you gave to someone that didn't need the control. You understand? Mm. It's mad. It is, yeah. I've kind of like, I, I think along the lines, it's, it's, not the, it's not what happens now. It's what happens in years to come. So that situation is going to be really difficult for them yeah. to understand because to them it's normal. Yeah. And then it becomes normalised as you go forward in mm -hmm. life. And like psychiatrists and that lot turn around and say, um, you, you close a door off, you close doors off. So you, you forget, you forget about the trauma, you forget about the pain until one day you're a little bit run down. And then someone, something, something triggers you, a smell, a noise, um, a, a film, uh, a, an item of clothing, bang, the doors are back open. Next thing you know, you've got PTSD and, and you're on tablets and you, you're suffering with anxiety and that lot. Um, but why wasn't this happening to me last week? Yeah, it's because I never dealt with it. I just closed the door. So, so when people close the door, they're not fixed. They're not saved. They haven't moved on. They're escaping. You, they're escaping. Yeah. And then one day, all that's going to come back. But the problem is, when it comes back, it comes back 10 times more. So you're then having to face it. But you're facing it now, broken again. Which is even worse. So how, how is the childhood trauma contributed to your life going forward? Has it, has it affected you in a massive way? Oh, yeah, man. Like, um, like I had a problem with authority, you know, massively. I, I found myself being, um, you know, it's, it's a horrible word and I'm ashamed of it, but I found myself becoming and being a neighborhood bully. Hmm. I didn't care about my neighbors. I didn't yeah. care about the people on the street. I didn't care about nothing. I had no fear. I had... I had anger and everybody that I approached, everyone that said no to me, everyone that stepped in my way, the visual of them was like my dad and I had to take him out because I weren't letting him control me no more. Are you with me? Mm. So I spent years just being a shell of a person. But at the time... At the time, I was like, I'm the man. Everyone's saying hello to me. Everyone knows who I am. I walk through the town. My mum can walk anywhere. Someone, if someone gets lippy, they turn around and say, that's Paul's mum. And they're like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Do you know what I mean? And you've got all that mad respect. But you realise it ain't respect, mate. It's fear. Yeah? Who can be a man when you, when you place fear into people's heart, into people's lives. They see you. They're only saying hello because they're worried that if you don't say hello, you're going to get smacked up. They're only, you know, waving to you so you they don't become a victim of me, you know? And I can't blame, I can't blame my dad for all of that. Yeah. You know, because it's my, it was my responsibility to be that person. I chose to be that person. I chose to be horrible, you know? And... It was really, really a rude awakening when I was on the run from the old bill for, um, you know, a weapons offence. And uh, I needed a place to hide out. And no one was interested. I skipped, I skipped town. I, I, went, I went and moved up to Warrington to hide out at a friend of mine called Gary Bundy's. And I was hiding out in his house when all this went on. Not one person. Not one person contacted me. Are you all right? Are you good? Do you need me to do anything? Nothing. So I've gone from being like thinking that I was a man and being like one of the most popular people in my town. So I only realised that people were happy I was gone. That's a big wow. And that's what I think like kids today, they don't understand. They're, they're looking at fear as respect. Now, fear, respect is earned from you being good 
positive karma, positive energy, manifesting positive, you know, that's all respect. Fear respect. If you died, people would be happy. Yeah. If you go to jail, no one will contact you because no one cares. They're happy you're gone, you know? They're relieved, yeah? Relieved is an understatement. I was alone, again. I was alone. I've gone from power to nothing. I'm nobody. Who, who am I? Like, what am I? What am I supposed to do now? Start again? Yo, what are you looking at? Hmm. What? Yeah, you. You looking at me? What are you looking at? <laughs> do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And then next time you say, "All right, cool. You didn't say nothing. Enough. Shake hands. Move on. I see you again in the street. You're gonna go, all right, pal? I'm like, yeah. all right, mate. How you doing? Yeah, I'm back to where I am again. What is that? Why? Why would you yeah. want to move that circle yeah. over and over and over again? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I start realizing that's not for me, and I need a change. Did I step away from crime? No, I didn't. I still carried on. Why? Because it's all I knew. Like, what did I have? I spent so long trying to be bad that I didn't pay attention to my future. Because if you ask me on careers day at school, what do I want to be? I want to be a gangster. That's me. I want to be mad. I want to be feared. I want to, I want to have the guns. I want to stick an axe in your head. I want to do all of that. Like, and now I look at it and I think, oh, like, did I think like that? Mm. Was that really me? And I do stuff with kids today and I think to myself, man, I hear your story and I'm like, wow, that's stupid, you know? Like, you don't want to be doing stuff like that. And they're like, well, you did it. And I was like, yeah, but look at me now. I'm full of regret. You know what I mean? I've, I've hurt people that would never forgive me again. Even no matter how much I apologise. I say, look guys, on my podcast, you know, if I ever done anything to anyone that I'd hurt, I'm sorry, yeah? And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. But I know that only like a small percentage of them people will see the change and they'll yeah. be like, do you know what? You're right now. I remember you used to be a bit of a problem. But the people that are hurt, that... Maybe, do I need the forgiveness from them? No, I just need them to understand that I, now I think about it, I realise that I was stupid. It was my fault. People don't let you forget the negative. Man. No. Did you ever go to jail because of any of you? I come close a couple of times. Come close. I come close. I had a couple of cases, one 12 and a half years I was looking at, um, and uh, the witnesses on that. And do you know what it is? Like, now I'm a big... Big knife crime. Uh, I've got my own charity, knife crime um, charity, fully legal. And uh, some of the charges that I've been up against were offensive weapon charges. Yeah. Um, you know, the that first case that fell apart um, because when they um, when they took statements from the people, um, they took them whilst they were drunk, so um, it was inadmissible. Um, but it, that court case went on for like just over a year. You know, I was banned. I was banned from my own town. I weren't allowed anywhere within within Suffolk where I was living at the time the crimes took place. Um, I weren't even allowed to see my family. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a couple of kids then. I weren't even allowed to see them. And this went on, do you know what I mean? Like, you sit there and you think to yourself, now I'm older and time's getting shorter, I realise how valuable time is because you can make a massive impact with a second. But you take a year out of your kids' lives you've completely changed this forever. Mm. You understand? But that was that was my choices. I've got to live with that. And I, I, I suffer daily because of it. Because I know that I took a year out of their life, a year that I could have been there to guide them in a more positive way. You know, it was my fault because I chose that day. Yeah. You know, the negative, and I followed through with it. So that case fell apart because of the witnesses, inadmissible. Um, second, that was Crown Court. I was up in Crown Court for that. It was a, that was a big that was a big thing, that was. Assault with a deadly weapon. Um, you know, and I, I you yeah, know, it was, it was something that I... I what, what, um, what motivated you to change and become uh, like a knife crime advocate? 
Well, that that was probably the biggest thing that ever happened to me in my life. Um, on Friday, uh, sorry, on February the eighth, um, five years ago, um, my my brother was stabbed and he died. Um, that blew my world. You see, because my brother was my dad. Like, don't get me wrong, he was a bit of a misfit, you know, a bit like all of us, you know, but um, he had a heart of gold and he was he was a lion, you know, like the most powerful man I ever knew. He's the kind of guy that suffered with drug addiction but still managed to keep his life together. I see the struggle in his eyes on a daily basis. I see I, he, I see him suffering, but he, he run. I've got a tattoo studio um, and, and he, he used to work in my studio, he used to run it all. Like on on a on a regular, it was probably the best that had ever been run. You know, it was clean. It was like it was like a prison cell. It was perfect, mm-hmm. just spotless. And he'd done all that whilst being on a, a, like a drug addiction. So he was he was managing his uh, his abbey. Yeah, I I call it um I call it uh what was his demons? The drugs demons, crack and heroin. So he's he's in the grip. Yeah, yeah, yeah crack and heroin. And do you know what? The first time he ever done crack was um, he was in prison. It was the first time he ever done it. He cellmate. His missus had finished with him whilst he was inside because he was looking at a big sentence. And uh, he was upset. He was angry. And his pad mate turned around and said, "Like, have some of this. That'll that'll settle you down for the night." And he had it, and that was it. I, I had the conversation with my turn and I said to him, like, you know, how did all this start? Like, you know, because I'd never known you to be that way. Like, I know he smoked, like, you remember hash when it was on the bars? He used to smoke smoke hash and that lot and do, do go to raves, do pills and stuff. Mm. But cracking heroin, I didn't think he was weak enough to grab that, you know. So to find out that, like, my brother had been taking it, but he managed it so well, I thought, you know, there's, there's no damage here. He's still living, he's still doing his thing. It wasn't until later on that his habit got worse. You know, he, he, the the place where he was when he got stabbed, he wasn't supposed to be. You know, he would get his drugs from a regular, from one guy. And uh, that guy had just been turned over by the police. And uh, he, he never had no drugs. So my brother had to go further into town. And it just so happened that someone had linked him up with this, with, with this dealer. He'd you know, was there to collect his um, stuff for the night. But my brother, what my brother didn't realise is these drug dealers got a tip off that they were going to get robbed um, by another local gang uh, that night. So when my brother turned up, new face, new line, they thought that he was there to rob them. You know, four months, four months, every single day in court proved that he wasn't there to rob them. You know, and... Uh, it was just wrong place, wrong time. You know, three three guys come out of the house. One of them was on the phone to another guy that was like in London, and uh, he was telling them just take him out. You know, just 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 mm. kill him. And uh, you know, the fight was um, it was on the road, on the path, on the road, on the path, just going backwards and forwards. Half past five in the afternoon, busy rush hour traffic on one of the busiest roads in where we're from. And as he was um, counter counter punching and moving back, he tripped on the curb. And when he went down, uh, one of the guys stabbed him whilst he was on the floor. And then they all ran off. So he got stabbed once. Got stabbed once, mate. And well, that was yeah. His life was gone. It nicked. It nicked an artery. And um, you know, one one of the things that we do when we go out to um, like these schools and stuff, and and we go to the youth clubs and we go on the streets and that lot and. You, you, the the craziest thing is these kids are carrying knives like this Rambo knives, and then they're carrying like potato peelers, you know, thinking if I've got a potato peeler, it ain't gonna do much damage because it's only small. But they don't realise that can still kill you if it nicks an artery, if it nicks a nerve, if it does anything. Yeah, you still, it's still. It's you damaging it. Yeah, it's it's, it's good. So, you know, I, I've seen all kinds of weapons, mate. We've took we took uh, a seven-inch blade from a 10-year-old girl at school. We've took a knife belt off of somebody. You know, when they got the buckle, yeah. it just looks like a like a Western buckle, you know? <laughs> and, it, like, you, you take it off and slide it out. You've got, you've got, it's a lock knife. 
credit cards, like credit card knives where you fold them up and they turn into a knife, you know? It's just absolutely mental what we're taking. Ingenious what people, are, what people can make these days, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, we done a little tester on, uh, on, on Wish and we was like, right, okay, let's buy a random amount of knives, see how long it takes. We bought four credit card knives, we bought uh, a brush knife, we bought just random things on this on this order. Within a week, they'd posted it through, I didn't even have to sign for it or nothing. Mm. I didn't have to clarify I was 18, I didn't have to do anything. Posted it through the letterbox. Mental. It fucking ran out of band, like, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely crazy. Yeah. So I lost my brother, I was on some, you know, at this point in my life, I had I hadn't changed completely you know so when I got the phone call from my mum it was uh, my brother my brother got my brother got killed at half past uh, half past five quarter to six on 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 the 8th of Feb what, what year was that five years ago what would that be 17, 17 2017 <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> quickly lick it <laughs> do you know what right 17th um 2017 on the 8th of February is, is, is like it's a significant day for me as well because that was the day that I went into the oncologist uh, on my last uh, chemo and was told that I'd got the all clear from the cancer. Really? And that was on the 8th of February 2017. I was just thinking as you were talking about the 8th of February, just kept like going, yeah, on that year. And it was do, five do, years do, ago. Do, do, do you know what it is? The crazy thing is, like, I believe in the universe, right? I yeah. believe that, that thing. So, you know, as. As my brother was, like, given the death sentence, you was given life. Yeah. How powerful is that? It's crazy, isn't it? Powerful. Tell me the universe don't work like that. Yeah. But congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. congratulations. I mean, oh, getting the all clear on that, just any day would have just been powerful for you. So, yeah, yeah. Well, well done to you, mate. Yeah, are you still clear? Yep, yeah. Good man. That's probably why you still eat your chicken and rice, isn't it? <laughs> still eat chicken and rice. Oh, it reminds me of fucking prison and that stuff. But you know, it's beneficial in the long run. Yeah. So what's um, what's what's what happened after that? So you know, you hadn't completely changed. Yeah. So I was still. You must have been full of anger and, and resentment and fuming, bitterness. Do you know, sadness, what loss, grief, the whole shooting kit. I I cannot explain to you in words the feeling that I had of feeling pain feeling loss feeling like I need to get you back you yeah. know what I mean like I, I, when when I got the phone call at half past 10 off my mum the 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 phone call the noise it's never gonna leave me mate yeah. it's never gonna they've got him they got him I was like who's got what he's dead who's dead she said my brother is dead I was like, nah, they probably got the wrong person. I said, who told you? She goes, the police. I said, where are they? She went, they're here. I was like, what? My mum's screaming. She's smashing up the house. She's she's like, I turned up to the house. There's two coppers there, absolutely petrified, mm. you know, because, you know, a bit hands on, you know, never been too kind with the police, you know. Um, I've got a lot of respect for the police now, you know, a lot of respect for the police now. Yeah. But before... It'd be would be pretty hands on, you know. Um, you know, please turn up to the house. It would be it would get physical straight away. You know, sending them on their way, whatever, whatever it is. Get you know, get off my land. You know, like all of that stuff. You know, you shouldn't be in my house. I'm, and my mum, she's a, <coughs> a feisty one. You know, old school. So she'd be like, hey, get out of my house. You know, get out of my house. I didn't invite you in. And she'd make them stand on the doorstep. You know, but this time they were in the house. They were standing in my mum's kitchen. My mum's kitchen is like a front room, you know. Everyone goes in there. We congregate in there. That is where we go. We drink tea, listen, yeah, watch the TV. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> mum's kitchen. The cooking's not good though, but like, it's still mum's kitchen. What's happening on there, mum? <laughs> so like, we, we was there. These two coppers are standing there. One of the coppers was a copper that used to nick me and my brother all the time when we were younger. Paul Lange, lovely woman. Yeah. Absolutely amazing woman. Her and her husband were coppers, but whenever they'd, like, if we was kicking off, they'd say, come on come over here and they, were, they were just normal like come over and not like get up against the car like none of that stuff you know they were just like come over here let me talk to you for a minute so I gave them respect because they, they deserved it you know mm. and she was standing there and she was just white you know she'd known my brother most of his life she'd known me since I was like eight you know and you know it's just 
to see her face like that, I knew that something was the matter. I looked at her and I said, you sure it's my brother? She went, it's your brother. Instantly, like, I, I went from, like, nah, you sure, to who did it? Where are they at? She goes, they're, they're from Ipswich, we don't know who it is. I said, I said, give me till the morning and I'll have them for you. I literally went in, kissed my mum on the head. I said, mum, I'm, I'm going to go get them. She was like, she, like she was swearing, get them. Make sure you get them. Mm. I said, I, I am. So I've gone out. I didn't land back home for seven days. It was the probably the worst seven days of my life. I didn't sleep. Never had no sleep. Never had no, oh, I went eating. I was just like, you know, just snacking as I was going through. I was all over the place, mate. I was at night time. I knew that all of the drug dealers and that lot was settled down in houses. So I'd start turning over the houses, you know, kicking in the door, finding out where they're selling first thing in the morning, turning over their spots, going up to them, giving them hiding. I was seeing all the homeless people on the streets that had that had habits, trying to ask them, where are these houses? Where are all the crack houses? Where are all the, you know, where are they selling from? Whose line is what? And I found out where all the lines were, all of the lines, but it was I was only after one line. And when I say line, that's the county drug line, right? So those that don't know what the county drug line is, it's um, they're like drugs that come from the cities, come down into um, you know the more rural areas, and each line has its own name. This line, I found out what the name was, so I started a tar uh, targeting that line and the people that were buying the drugs from that line and everybody that was active with that line. Yeah. Within the morning, by by half six in the morning, I'd found out. A couple of witnesses who witnessed it in the cars that it happened with them in in the car so i had them they come forwards they get i got the number off them moved it on to the police because they were witnesses and uh, they described to me what the people looked like i went everywhere for these people everywhere i even went to a psychic medium to see if she could tell me anything you know she gave me a little bit of a a little bit of an insight which turned out like two weeks later after she had told me it was a drug line from London that two people were arrested in London to do with my brother's murder. Can you believe that? Mm. So I said to the police, I said, like, do you have mediums help you solve cases? They said, sometimes. So then I'm like, I'm like a dog with a bone. I'm like, all right, so I'm looking for two people from London. How am I going to find them? I'm not even in London. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in Suffolk. I'm in Ipswich. So I started hitting the line and I started targeting their drug dealers i started targeting their um the people that are selling the drugs the just the the, the scum and i started i started taking them out one at a time to the point where they didn't want to be on the street because if i spotted them i was i was having them you know um i went robbing them got, i got no interest in drugs never done any got no interest in drugs whatsoever my point was information i needed information and then over the seven days, less and less people were on the street. The homeless and that lot wasn't coming in the town to do their begging and stuff because I was active. I was around the market. I was around all the little alleyways. There weren't nowhere that these, these could hide from us. And I started finding out addresses, turning up to the addresses. I turned up to this one address for one of the guys. It was a flat. And uh, I've gone up to the flat and banging on the door. Because I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for revenge, and I am out. I'm out to kill four people. You know, that was my mission for the first for the first seven days. Yeah, my mission was revenge. You took my brother. I'm yeah. going to kill all of you. Um, and I didn't care about the consequences. I didn't care about the repercussions. I didn't care nothing because I have to make sure that you know that I ain't messing around. Yeah, you took what's mine. I'm, I'm coming for you. So I'm banging on the door at this house. I phoned up this guy. I said, you told me he was going to be here. He was like, I swear to you, he's there, he's there. I said, you lied to me. I'm kicking off, like I'm really kicking off, yeah? To the point where I'm leaning on a car that was in a driveway downstairs, yeah? So I'm leaning on his car. It wasn't until we got to court that the person had moved out of his house and into the van that I was leaning on. And he was in the van. Hearing everything you were saying. Hearing everything I was saying. And he didn't get out of the van. He didn't. He, there's no. If he would have got out of the van, I would have killed him that day, hundred percent. 
Now I see yeah. that it was stupid to even think that way. You understand? Because I move, I move in a positive way now. So after the seven days, it got to the point where I'd see some people, these two people, they were coming down. They were walking down the road. They spotted me and legged it. So I'm like, why are they legging it? I've got to get them. So I've gone running after them. They've ran. They've gone into this house and they closed the patio door. As they close the door, they're standing there because I'm, I'm like a minute behind them, you know. They're cl- closing the patio door and they're just smiling at us, like thinking that they're safe and in. I just carried on running. I ran straight through the door and speared the guy on the other side. Mm. The other guy, he ran off and, you know, the guy that was on the floor with glass all over me and him, he just was like, what? The-? Like, he was just freaking out because I just ran through a window and speared him. Turned out that it ran because um, they knew that I was just going after everybody and they On didn't the want to be things. Yeah. So now I had to sit there and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, well, you shouldn't have run. You should have just faced it. And he was like, mate, I've, you know, this, I've heard of everything what's going on. So I had to leave. I had left and I left thinking, what am I doing? Do you know what I mean? What am I doing? It took me a minute to like to get myself together again. Do you know what I mean? To think, what am I going to do now? And I thought, I'm going to go back to my shop. So I went back to my shop and I just waited. Within an hour of being back in my shop, everyone started coming to me because they wanted to they wanted to take themselves out of the equation. It wasn't me, brother, I promise you. I swear to you, I'll give you this information. I'll help you. If you yeah. need anything, let me know. So I'm like, right, you're a target, you're a target, you're a target until I can prove that you're not. So I had these, um, there's like three or four guys that were arrested for the murder of my brother. I had them around me. That was really hard. That was really hard because they've been released on bail for the murder of my brother. But they swear they never done it. And they swear they was going to help me find them. So I'm dealing with all kinds of emotions. I'm trying not to just like, mm. you know, when, they, when they're standing, I'm trying not to just take their head off, you know. But at the same time, I'm trying, I need their help. I need their help to help me. It turned out the people that were helping me, they had nothing to do with my brother's murder. You know, so the way I was thinking was just mad because these these four guys, they they would have been hurt. You know, for what? For nothing. Did anyone get convicted? Yeah. 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 I managed to find the people. Um, one of them ended up, he got caught out um, near a car wash in, in my area. He got stabbed twice. Um I, they had nothing to do with me I didn't get arrested or nothing for it but he ended up getting stabbed twice um, survived which yeah. really shocked me because he was a frail like he was the guy that stabbed my brother and he was just nothing mate I looked at him and I was like oh, there's no way you're the guy that killed my brother no way Seems for you to, yeah, yeah for you to take my brother you would have had to have been the Hulk Iron Man like Spider-Man all wrapped into one you know but it wasn't it was just some like do you know when a crackhead's gone too far and you can see they're gaunt, you can see they're all drawn in, it's just skin on bone. This guy took my brother and I couldn't believe it. So he got arrested. He was the one that done it. They actually convicted him. He got 22 years life. Um, he had to serve full sentence before he could even apply for parole. And then from that, the domino started happening. They caught the next one and the next one, the next one. So all four were convicted. The other three were convicted 18 years life serve the full sentence there's no percentage took off of it there's no yeah. nothing it's really hard because the two older ones they will be late 60s early 70s before they can even apply for parole so they're as good as dead in jail yeah but the two younger ones yeah. they're going to be 40s when they come out yeah do you know what i mean still got a whole life ahead of them still got a thing and that that hurts you know like it does hurt but and what can you do Mm. what can you do because you're suffering you're suffering this thing and I, I think when and especially me when I was younger and probably yourself you know when I was out committing these crimes there's no way I thought about victims <laughs> I did not think about victims I didn't think about a ripple effect I didn't think about repercussions I never thought about anything because I was power like where did I get that where did I get that from at what point did anyone install that power into me? Like, am I like my dad? Like, am I him? That I've created my own power to a point where I feel like I can do whatever I want. Yeah. You know, has that rubbed off on me? I don't know, man. 
now I now I'm clear. I'm clear with life now. I'm clear with my conscience. I'm clear with everything because I have a purpose now. Yeah, you know that purpose is is out to to you know help educate youths on you know the effects of crime. You know the long term damage. The not only what you think about it. Yeah, no families come to these guys. Just one guy that was there was family that turned up. The kid was a wrong un. The kid was a wrong un. Yeah. But his family wasn't. He come from good stock. Brother and sister, educated. Dentist, doctor. You know? I think the dad, that's what the dad was saying. The dad, religious man. Like, just just <laughs> couldn't believe his son was like the way he is. <laughs> from you know? Man. And and manners. Boy. The old man, the dad, to one of them, he was, uh, he come up to my mum. And of course, I'm staunch, you know what I mean? I'm like, like, what are you doing? You know, what are you coming near my mum for? He goes, if my son has done this, I'm truly sorry. I didn't bring my son up this way. I'm a religious man. He's brothers. And she, he's the one that told us about the brothers and sisters and that lot. Mm. And I'm looking at him and I'm looking at the guy and I'm like, I want to kill you. Yeah. And when I get my hands on you, if I can get my hands on you, I'm going to take you out. But now going over five years, yeah. having to manifest and deal with that, I think to myself, you've killed your dad as well. You killed your dad, you killed your mum, you killed your brother and you killed your sister. You killed everybody of your family. When that night when you took part in taking my brother's life, you killed your family, all of it. And for him to be able to come out of jail in his 40s, and, and, and do you know what it is? Why, am I think, why do I think this way? Why am I thinking about the future of this person? Why am I thinking about this person's family? Why am I thinking about all of the negative that he's done to me and my family? I'm thinking about how it's affected his family as well. Because we're all victims. Yeah. We're all victims. And that's what people don't understand. People say, would you ever forgive them? I'm a long way off of that, man. I'm not, I'm not at that point in my life yet. And I don't, you know what? I don't even think I will be. And that's not because, that's not because I don't feel like they, they need forgiving or it's not because I don't feel like I, I'm not worthy to forgive because I still hold hate. You know, Michael Emmett, a good friend of both of ours, he says to me, son, you need to forgive. I said, I can't, man. And he tried to explain it to me and I understood. I understood exactly what he means. Yeah, so like he's putting yourself on a hook, isn't he? Yeah. You know, you're on the hook. You're, you're drinking a poison. Open someone else's eye from me. Yeah. It's, and you're, you're the one suffering. Yeah. And when you don't day. let go. And you know, people say to us when we do talks at colleges and stuff, trying to educate these youths on carrying knives. And, you know, that's solely my mission now. I literally, I work in my tattoo studio tattooing. And then I come out and do podcasts to help raise awareness with yourself and many other people. I also do podcasts, but I also do talks around schools and universities and and uh, youth clubs. And I, I go out to the street. You know, we've got we've got our own little team where we go out to the streets and we go and talk to these youths. You know, we set up um, police v um, street boys um, basketball tournaments and things like that. And it really is working. Like it's a slow process, but it's working. We'd done our first trial run on that last year and it was a success. It was massive. This year we've got another one doing, so it's our second one and we're hoping that this will make a massive difference as well because all the kids that took part in it before, they are, they do think now. Mm. They're thinking. And that's good because when you're going out and you're not thinking about what you're doing, them two seconds that you use to stab someone to cause any harm to anybody can give you 20 years. You're going to... You're going to throw the dice and you're going to lose 20 years of your life for two seconds. It doesn't make sense. No one is telling these kids that two seconds of mistake is going to cost you 20 years of your life. I don't know. You try and be 40 years old, come out, try and get a mortgage, try and get a wife, a life partner, a child, grandchildren, a career. You try and do that. At 40 is way harder than what it is when you're when, when you're 18 I know this because I'm living it yeah <laughs> you know what I mean I live this you know I try and try and get a mortgage it was an absolute nightmare set up a business that was hard no one wants to give you the benefit of the doubt no one wants nothing 
you know? Yeah, yeah, you can have kids at 40, but, you know, when they go to high school, 10, 11 years old, and you're 51, 52, feeling the struggles of what you've given to yourself, the aches and the pains and... Fucking hell, it's so as me, but I've got a baby who's two years old. <laughs> I've got, I've, but, but me, I've got a one-year-old, two-year-old, and it goes up from there. But you understand it yourself. Like, yeah. You're now eating better. Yeah. So you, in, instead of like it coming naturally when you're in your 20s, you're now having to put things into place to make yourself be fit and ready. Yeah, life goals. Yeah. Life goals. You're having to do that because it ain't coming natural anymore. We've, we've out-timed our body clock yeah. and we've got to force that into us now. Like, you know, you was eating chicken and rice. You said, oh, I absolutely hate this, but I've got to do it. Where... 20 years ago, you could eat a Big Mac and go for a five-mile run. Ah, I see these kids now just eating what they want and I get jealous and I think, well, okay, <laughs> yeah, look at that. He's just like throwing a sand. It's not like a rake. You can't do that no more. Yeah. Sugar yeah. sticks to my ass. I walk out the door and it's like, fuck, you know, what's going on here? Exactly. You know, and and when as you get older, you worry about stuff like this. Yeah. Of know? course, yeah. It's, um, like you said before, time runs out. You know, we don't get any younger and we're not getting any fucking, you know, life doesn't get any easier. Mm-hmm the older we get. So you've got to start to putting things into place. You know, and I like the fact that you're doing a lot of positive things in the community. You've, you've sought redemption. You know, it's hard to forgive. It is difficult to forgive. I can imagine, you know, I couldn't imagine, should I say, I'm not saying I could imagine, but I couldn't imagine having to experience what you've experienced, knowing who it was, seeing what they're going through, and like, going, yeah, forgiveness. Yeah, you know, my dad was the same. You know, I did forgive because it was a different kind of situation. Yeah, you yeah. know, didn't yeah. actually lose anyone apart from myself. Yeah, and to find myself, I had to forgive, and that was that. That was the healing process for me at that time. But yeah, it's like, and you, you, you know, you've got yourself a podcast, and with all that, I'm going to put all the links. By the way, it's Paul Stansby's podcast. You'll find them on uh, Instagram and all social media platforms. But we'll talk about your podcast and what you aim to kind of what, what your reach is, what your outlook is yeah. going forward with your, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I, I thought when it was yeah. like, when I started all of it, I, I, I figured that I had to get myself out there. Yeah. I had to make these youths listen so they didn't cause more trauma to, to families and go through what I've had to go through. Yeah. Since my brother died, my mum's been on suicide watch every day for five years. You know, I, I wait for that phone call every morning because... My mum doesn't want to be here. My mum died the same same night. Do you know what I mean? She really did. My, you know, my stepdad, he had a stroke the next day. You know, this is all trauma from stress that's come from such a weak act, you know, which made them feel powerful right up until they went to jail. Do you know what I mean? So what I'd done is I needed to get people to talk about the trauma because yeah. I, 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 the way I saw it was when they advertised that someone's dead in a newspaper father of five Dean Stansby he's died um, from a knife attack and then the next day they say Dean Stansby father of five um, attacked because of robbing drug dealers now the newspaper were allowed to put all this horrible slanderous stuff but then once it was proven in court that he wasn't there to rob drug dealers and he was just there to get drugs they stopped printing it but but in that four months five six months they, he went from a victim to how he deserved it. Like, how is that okay? You know, so there was never, whenever you see anyone that's been stabbed by a knife crime or anything like that, you never ever see um, the trauma side of it. Families that are suffering, the, uh, you know, the suicide attempts from losing a child, the, just the emptiness, the just destruction. So I thought, I need to start showing these kids just the damage that's caused. And I figured... Well, I've been about the streets. A lot of kids in my area, they will they will listen to what I'm saying because of who I yeah, who yeah. I am, yeah. So I then had a purpose to be able to help other people from going through this trauma and explain the stuff just because I had the visual. And because of that, kids listen. And things are changing slowly, they're changing. We can't do it overnight, you know this. The only way I could do it is if, you know, when I said at the beginning of the podcast, you need to talk, yeah, because it's powerful that men talk. So I did. I, I put it all out, my story from when I lost my brother right the way through to recent dates. I put it out there. I started getting real positive feedback. So I didn't plan on doing podcasts yeah. at all. 
I didn't plan on doing it at all because, you know, this is all alien to me. It's technology. I'm not into it, you know. And um, so I put my story out there and other people going, that was really brave what you've done. You know, I've really, that made me cry. It made me think. So I'm thinking, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, people are listening. So then I started getting mothers in. Another kid was killed in my town. Um, and a young lad, uh, that was a gang related thing. Again, two gangs went at each other, a young man died. Four or five, five people got arrested and put in jail for that. And some of the people I knew when they were born, do you know what I mean? I knew these when they were born, now they're serving life sentences. It's like, it's just mental. Mm. So I interviewed her and then from that, someone else come forward and then someone else come forward. The next thing, I've got people listening to actual, listening to the message, which is the trauma. like. Don't yeah. do crime because this is the effect. So I then started reaching out, and I, I, you know I was watching films and stuff. I watched your film, you know that that, that you'd done mental, mate. You know, like just crazy what you what you'd gone through. And I, I watched gangster films, and I started seeing like you know what's the biggest gross gangster film, blah blah blah. And it's coming up, and like these these are being watched, idolized, and then carried on in real life like people are going out being like I want to be just like them and they're living by the sword they're dying by the sword more dying than living you know so I started podcasting victims and real high end criminals criminals that have been at the highest right down to the cesspit of low you know like where they're feeling like I need to take my life I just can't do this no more and you know crime is glorified Everything negative is glorified. YouTube beef glorified. Yeah. Drill music, rap music glorified. You know, as long as it's negative, it's getting views. You put something positive next to something negative, the negative will always get viewed more than the positive. Why is yeah, that? It's weird, isn't it? I've Why noticed that, that, you see, because I noticed that. There's a lot of, um, with the YouTube beef that goes on, you know, you can't help because you, you've got, you've either got someone you subscribe to that you follow that's got a positive message that's interviewed someone that is having beef with someone and then all of a sudden, it's, there's a medical round yep. of the same people doing the same thing, shouting out the odds. And I agree with you could put something up positive. I could put something up really positive. It's a, a, a you know a Pulitzer Prize winning story, right? And next thing there'll be a negative uh, post about something, and that will reach more. Yeah. And I think, fucking hell. Then I, my my thinking goes, shall I go down that route? Yeah. Chase the views. Yeah. Chase the comments, and then I feel. And then I just come to my senses and go, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. You know, that's a shelf life. But you, yeah, exactly. And you end up getting more views, but you feel less yeah. about yourself, like you know? That. And and you, you have to, like, why does everyone approach life like, I'm getting a buzz, I'm getting a win from something that's, that's at a loss? Like, yeah. you know, if I'm number one and you're number two, I'm happy that you're number two. But that means, am I ill? Because I'm thinking, like... I'm getting happy off of your your misery because you ain't first, I'm first. But at the end of the day, you took part, I took part. We're both winners at the end of the day. As mm. long as you're producing that positive, yeah, me and you are on the same path. Yeah. You know, we're made from the same stuff. So why is it that if we're all made from the same product, yeah, blood, bones, all of the above, right? Why are we all so different? And that's trauma. We're so different because we accept things to affect us in different ways which separates us from being able to be human to be able to be positive to be able to spread the negative uh, spread the positive excel the negative you know for some reason we hold on to negative like it's going to do something for us a positive later on eventually when you find yourself and you learn to deal with it and you end up loving yourself you can then push forward to a positive but until then why is it that we accept like if someone gives you a hug yeah yeah and you accept that hug oh nice one you'll one hand it two hand it whatever yeah but then and then you'll go and it, you won't think about it because it's an it's you know you just hug and that was it you won't think about that but if someone turns around and tells you like you're you're a dickhead or something like that sorry uh, if you you'll hold on to that like why would you hold on to that and then you'll you'll be manifesting you'll be churning you think i need to get this person you know why are we consuming the only thing that we can't replace is time. Why are we wasting time on that negative and letting that thing where if we accept that hug like we accept that negative, you will end up putting your hands all the way around and you'll hold on for that little bit of a second and that's when you'll feel that warmth. 
yeah? And then you'll let go. And then you'll be like, you have a good day, all right? I'll see you soon, yeah? yeah. And you'll walk off and you'll feel good. <laughs> yeah. But because we're not accepting that yeah. like we accept the negative. Because with the negative, we're now built up ready. Like, I can't believe you just said that. I want to chew your face off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I want to, like, why, why, why do you think you can tell me that? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I'm about? Nah, that's a step away from that. Embrace the hug. Mm. Better than the negative. You'll go and you'll keep pushing. Mm. Positive, you know? I like the I like I like the attitude. Yeah. Yeah, I like the um, the, but way you, the way you it, weirded it, that up. It's trauma, mate. Why did I have to let something so bad happen to me before I accepted all that positive? Why? Why do we like go to funerals and tell family that we love them and we should stay in contact? Why do we sit there and wish we'd done more when we lose a friend to mental health suicide? Why is it that when we lose someone that we, we love, like a, a girlfriend. Why do we abuse that situation until they leave? And then like, oh my God, mm. I love you. I want you back. But it's too late because you've already caused the damage. Because we take things for granted and life is compl- and we get complacent with life. This is what I've learned over the years. We get, we get complacent. We take things for granted. We forget our moral compass and we always believe that it'll be there. Yeah. And then it's gone. Mm-hmm. It's like if I put my phone down, it's a massive loss. I'm looking for it. Yeah. Right. What the f- where, where is it? Searching, rummaging around the house, upstairs. Oh, f- f- it's there. Right. It's not going anywhere. It was in the house. Mm-hmm. But the anxiety and all the stuff that goes with it, the crisis that I go in yeah. into, it's just for a simple thing like my car keys or my phone or me what anything like that. Yeah. It's not even like it's just a possession. Yeah. You know, it's like the feelings that it brings up. Is why does that affect us? Because we feel like we're losing something that we're so attached to, and that's what we're all. That's what we're, what life's about. We we attach ourselves to things. You know, we we we'll pretend to be. We'll sit. We'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll hang around with someone who, who who we think is a somebody because we want to feel like part of something but go back to the whole phone thing right yeah go back to the phone i bet you you could probably tell me things about other people on social media more than you could tell me probably what i don't know you you got brothers sisters yeah 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 you could probably tell me more about people on social media than you yeah. could probably tell me your <laughs> sister or your brother's favorite color his favorite outfit favorite music I'll definitely I'll tell you who's fucking arguing to do on fucking YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, I didn't realise this until it happened, but when I lost my brother, I thought I knew everything about my brother. But when I lost my brother and I had to pick his favourite outfit, his music to, to get cremated to, yeah. his music to get walked into, I didn't know none of it. You know, as far as I was concerned, it was... Peter Andre, mysterious girl, because we were all dancing, piss one night, uh, you know, and we was all dancing, he was singing off, he, off his head, you know what I mean? Uh, mm. Like, I didn't actually know, I just assumed, you know, like, or his favourite colour, his favourite number, his favourite anything. When it truly mattered, I didn't actually know the person I loved the most. Because I was too busy trying to be bad. I was too busy trying to know what my friend was up to. I was too, too busy trying to see what that girl was on. You know, yeah. I was too busy trying to know everything about what I, nothing. Because none of it that I knew benefited me at the time it mattered. We're too complacent with the people that we care about. Yeah, we are. And I learned that lesson years, years ago when my brother, who has autism, Joe, was trying to tell me about his day and I'm scrolling social media and I'm liking someone's roast dinner and fucking some part of the country that, it, you know, doesn't, you know, mean nothing to me or I'm liking someone's post and he's just sitting there and I'm like, give us a minute, give us a day. Yeah. Come back tomorrow, in a week, next month. And then, you know, he, he didn't come in then and he didn't sit down and he didn't want to talk to me. One day he just got up and walked out, didn't even say nothing. and. and it was at that moment where I just had a moment of clarity and I put the phone down and I thought, oh, God, that's my brother, you know. I want to see what he wants to say, what, what he's got to say about his day. And that's it. And that was the best relationship. It blossomed. You know, I know a lot about him. I know more about him than I do myself. 
which was great, you know, a, a kind of um, and always and always little quirks and the way he behaves and how he feels around certain situations and certain people and, and crowds and not crowds and you know wh- where what he likes to drink and what he doesn't like to drink, how he likes his tea, you know, um how the fact that he likes you to make a tea or he likes to make a tea for you even though he can't make it. You know? <laughs> I, I just know these things now yeah. because of being around him. Yeah, so now, much. now, now you say, Joe, yeah. I, I, I see you a lot on social media with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, he loves you. You can see it. Yeah. Like the time when he ordered a beer at the, um, like I asked you if you had a brother, but now I remember you have a brother because yeah. he ordered a beer at the yeah. pub, didn't he? And yeah. he had the card and that lot. Like, and was, that was me giving him some um, some independence because he, you know, giving it was my obviously it's my card and and he, and he, 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 he has, has to tap on that. And the fair, what he did do was like he ordered himself a pint. He knows I don't drink, but then. As an afterthought, he said, "Would you like a coke?" <laughs> and I thought that that was nice because he yeah. didn't just think about himself. Even though he's got autism, he didn't just go, "I'm having a pint of the card bank." I know he doesn't drink, but would you like a coke, Bill? You know, and that was nice. And that 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 movie, that moment, I was like, oh, "What a fucking guy!" Do you know what that did me as well? Yeah. You know, even from onlookers on, can see like you know you're a powerful guy, and you know that you you are showing who you truly are. Yeah with this young man do you know what I mean yeah. and, you know and, and he looks at you man the way he looks at you is just um, it's, it's, it's comforting you know mm. what I'm saying because now you've had the clarity now you've took the time to invest into your brother he's done exactly the same back to you yeah. now if that's not true respect what we should be looking for amongst people yeah I don't know what it is right yeah, because I tell you what, man, just that thirty seconds, just that one little act that you did there of positivity towards him, opened him up so much to do something he probably would never have done if you wasn't standing there by him. Yeah, that's true. So either just froze, yeah, either froze. You would have been lost. He wouldn't know what to do. We've got no guidance, no direction, and he needed, he needed that like. How was he like that rock as he calls it? You gave him that, yeah. You, and that's something that I, I don't know. It, it, it's something I find difficult to accept. You know that I feel because it's he's given me more than I've gave him. He doesn't realise that he's gave me the in, the inspiration to to be a better person, to be a bit more mindful, yeah, to be a lot more patient, to listen. To have a laugh, to treat him as a normal person. Yeah. Not to, not to. Oh, he's got autism. We've got to be special. We've got to have kids close around our Joe. I'll talk to him the way I'll talk to you. The yeah. way I'll talk to my mum. The way I talk. You know, the language will come out. The effing and blind, and that it doesn't matter because he's not. He wasn't brought up in fucking mother care. You know, yeah. he's around yeah. a big family. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's he's quite. He can be quite vocal himself with his language when he gets angry, especially when his team's losing or he can't stand. Liverpool, he'll fucking go for it. <laughs> so we let him get on with it, and that's how I like it. You know what I mean? I, I know exactly where you come from. My mum's a foster carer. She's yeah. got um, two two um, two children with autism, and um, one of the kids is called Les. But he wanted to create himself, and uh, I'm exactly the same as you. I treat him exactly the same as how we are. Yeah, I don't treat him like he's got a disability because at the end of the day, you see the people with disabilities and stuff. They're the ones that are living, not us. No, because they ain't got care in the world. I think he's blessed. Yeah, hundred percent with his autism. Hundred percent, never me. No one. He doesn't suffer. I don't believe in that word suffering because he's not suffering. He's blessed. Yeah. To have that innocence, and it's just, it's just, it's just a nice little aura, a nice feeling. Now I've got to book meetings into to see him because his life is so full. I'm thinking, fucking hell, lad. Fun. All right, Joe, what's happening, mate? Yeah, I'll come and see you tomorrow, lad. Oh, I'm busy doing dance lessons you what oh, yeah I'm doing dance lessons alright what about, what about Wednesday I'm going to work well, like I said, I'll be there Friday with the farm <laughs> what, about, what about Saturday lad working at the cafe so and then I go what about me <laughs> poor me will be me I'll make it all about me then right and I think hello lad but because of the time that you've given him mm. because of that power that you've created that energy that you've created yeah, he's able to go and do the That's dances. it, you know, and, and that's one reflection. I sit back and I go, do you know what? I feel like me, me job's done in a sense of like he's got a full life. 
he doesn't need to be hanging around with his brother every fucking day. You know, although it was nice and we had a long a lot of time together through the lockdown and when I was staying at my mum's and you know, it, and and I tend to go down at least once or twice a week and we have a bit of a bit of a laugh. Mm -hmm. Loves the look, he loves the audience. The phone's out. He's a he's a he's a he's a fucking he's a he's a he's a movie star, but yeah, he's great and I know what it's like to have a brother, and I wouldn't know what I, 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 I would feel. To lose. I know how I would feel. I feel if, if to lose, so I can understand everything that you've said. You know, we're both big men, and we've both got brothers who we've loved and we still love. Mm -hmm. You know, and unfortunately, you've lost yours, and I've got my my brother who's, who's still here. And I wouldn't like to think look at anything bad that happened to him. You know. Yeah. Live for the moment every day, guys, because I, I, I swear to you, I like, you know, when you sit there and you have your little arguments or you have a thing, can you imagine, you know, in the lifestyle that you lived, if um, if anything would have happened to you, you, you know, your brother wouldn't be the person he is today without you, no. you know, it'd be, it'd still be, it'd still be Joe, it'd still be the way he is, yeah. but he wouldn't be how he is without you and your guidance, you know, just that little acceptance, he wouldn't have been like that. So, you know, like I said, me and my brother, you know, we was close, but we was also we we fought all the time. You know, we yeah, never we never yeah. ever physical with each other. It was all words. But unfortunately for me, you know, the last words that me and my brother had wasn't very pleasant. You know, mm. I, I told him about himself. You know, and I, you know, normally we'd see each other and go, "You good?" It's like, "Yeah, you good?" And it's like, "Yeah, love you, bruv." Kiss him. He'll always kiss me on top of the head, and it would be would be cool. That's it, done. Mm. I'm got that. I ain't got that option anymore. You know, and them words will resonate with me forever. And because of that, I have to keep pushing the message. You know, I have to do carry on with my YouTube. I have to, you know, not for clout chasing, but for the message of mm. understanding who you've got in your life and what you can do with the time that you have. Don't waste any of it on negativity because you don't want to live with this. You really don't want to live with this. You don't want to live with the pain of losing someone. You don't want to live with your last words being what they are. You know, you don't want to have to go through life just hoping and praying that whatever you're doing, they can see, you know, from the spiritual world or whatever. Because if I could turn back time, I would 100% show him what he meant to me. Instead of just assuming he knew. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. That's the hard thing. So I'll carry on. I'll carry on. Even, you know, doing these podcasts, you know, on the drive home, it's like a four hour drive home. I will think about this the whole journey. It will play on my mind tonight of, you know, did we get the message out there? And I'll be thinking about what happened to my brother. So there's always mad, horrible trauma that happens for every time I open my mouth when it comes to this. But I know, I know that it's being heard and it's resonating with people. And people are going to, you know, I'll get some hate. I don't really care. Do you know what mm. I mean? Because if you're hating me, you're listening to me. And I've got that power. Because for you to hate me, you had to have heard me. You understand? And at some point in your life, something will click. Just like it did with the clarity for your brother. Mm. Something at some point will click. And that's when you'll hear me again. Yeah, so if I fall on negative words... That's okay, because when you turn your life around, you'll remember me, mm. and you'll remember what I say, and that will help you. Brilliant. You know, so I'm good with a negative energy, because I'll just turn that stuff around and put it back out there again in a positive way. <laughs> You're brilliant. So anyway, we're going to come to the end of this podcast, yes, Paul. Yes, mate, yeah. At the end of every podcast, I always ask, and you've, you've said enough, really, to be fair, I always ask for a pearl of wisdom. What would you say, right, to a young Paul Stansby, walking through the doors of life. If you had the opportunity now to see Paul walking through the door and you see him there and it was a chance to give him some guidance, what would you say? What words would you give? You know what? Just, there's just so many, you know, but I, I would just turn around and say, like, evaluate yourself. Learn to love yourself because with whatever you do within your life, if you do not accept what you are and what you're going to become or how you're going to become, you yeah. can never ever leave an impression that's a positive and you can never ever get anybody to to um, be able to listen to you to push for a more positive lifestyle. I'd just go and be positive because if you do not manifest karma in a positive way, you're going to live your life in a negative and you're going to lose the only thing that you have in life that you can't replace and that's time. Don't let it be too late before you realise who you are or before you before you start to love yourself. 
So yeah, love yourself, man. Brilliant. I'm with that. Thank you. Thank you.